Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Everybody Bible Study, the Bible study for everybody. Um, give me just a second. Having a late start today, but no. All right. <laughs> the life that has been my week. Um, constantly feeling like I'm having to play catch up, but okay. Woo! So we're almost ready to go. I just need to set up the camera. Getting started. Uh oh. Okay, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> so tired. Like, oh, please not now. Please don't have a. Please don't mess up on me now. Okay. There is. All right, now we're ready to go. <laughs> I guess I can do the intro for those who are listening to the playback, right, on on my channel. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome back to another Everybody Bible Study, the Bible study for everybody. You know, gotta gotta make sure we include everyone. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and uh, have some prayer. Lord God, I just want to take time to thank you for another day. Thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy, God. Um, Lord, I just pray that on tonight you would open up our hearts and our minds, God, that we receive your word with gladness, Lord God. Um, I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to see you in your word before we come seeing what we can get for ourselves, but that we would genuinely just use this time to get to know you better and teach us how to apply these words in our own life. Um, Lord God, I pray that you would use me as you see fit, God, that your Holy Spirit would just take over on tonight. And Lord, that you would give me the wisdom and the guidance to teach your people the word in a way that is pleasing and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name I pray, thank God, and amen. Okay. <laughs> so, um, ironically, right, we need, we are still um, talking about Hadas, right, in verse uh, 16 of Romans. Three. Okay, so we're still talking about this word hadas, paths, right? But in the Greek, it's the word hadas. Uh, we talked about a couple of things, right? Looked at um, Peter, Second Peter. We looked at uh, well, first we looked at right how you know when we're talking about a spiritual pathway, it's like where are we leading? people too, right? Or, you know, what path are we taking? Because if we're saying we're believers, then that also means we're called to walk the path of righteousness, right? And what does that entail? And so we're kind of looking at that as well, right? But tonight, uh, we're continuing on with this definition of hadas. Now, remember, it has a lot of definitions, but there were some specifically right, that I wanted us to go over. And again, there are many scripture references, but I'm only going to cover just a few of them specifically that I prayed on. I was like, okay, God, show me which ones, you know, to, to cover, okay? So the next one we're going to look at, okay, is Hebrews. We're going to, you know, be coming from Hebrews. And this time and the last time I came um, mainly from the King James. Well, you know what? Okay. I just, okay, out of obedience. <laughs> I still don't know if I can explain it. 
I hear that little voice is like, and you're going to do King James and Amplified again. So that's what I'm going to do, <laughs> King James and Amplified again. Okay. So last time, like I said, we're, we were looking at Hadass and how it can be used in terms of a path, a spiritual path of righteousness. Um, now we're looking at, you know, how it's a path of God. Okay, let me make sure I'm, I'm reading my notes right because sometimes my notes can get a little scattered. I want to make sure, yeah. So metaphorically, a course of conduct or way of thinking in terms of righteousness, and now we're talking about in terms of God. Specifically, the way instructed and approved by God. So the way instructed and approved by God. And so for this, we're going to be coming from Hebrews chapter 3. Verse 10. Hebrews chapter 3. If I can just get my... Up to come up. Okay, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10. And so again, um, you know, I'm going to be reading from the two translations, but this time I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I'm going to be reading from Amplified first and then King James. Okay, so I hope you don't mind. <laughs> right. Like, you know... The, Literally, the only way I can explain it, it's like, okay, sometimes it feels like it's happening in that moment, but um, now I'm trying to get resituated because I'm not sure what's going on today. Oh, but that's fine. Okay, Lord. Um, I'm not sure how to explain it, but sometimes it's like it happens in that moment where the Lord is just like, do it this way. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like in that moment, it's like, just do just do what he said do. Just do what he said do. Okay, so that's how I'm going to read it, okay? So again, this is Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, starting with the Amplified first. Therefore, I was angered with this generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they did not know my ways, nor become progressively better and more intimately acquainted with them. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, Amplified, now in the King James. Uh, Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, in James Version. So notice, right, they have not known my ways. Talking about the ways of God, specifically the way instructed and approved by God, right? Now, something I noticed is that in this, this verse specifically kind of, um, kind of goes back, right, and I just saw in my notes, I actually need to go, we need to read a little bit more than just that one verse. I'm going to read, I'm still in Hebrews 3, but I'm going to read a little bit more this time. Okay. So this time we're going to read uh, verses 8 through 13 and then go back to uh, verse 10. Okay. So again, going to Amplify. This is Hebrews chapter 3, starting at verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as your fathers did in the rebellion of Israel at Meribah on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing my forbearance and tolerance and saw my works for 40 years and found I stood their test. Therefore, I was angered with this generation, and I said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they did not know my ways, nor become progressively better and more intimately acquainted with them. So I swore an oath in my wrath 
They shall not enter my rest, the promised land. Verse 12, take care, brothers and sisters, that there not be in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart, which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. 13, but continually encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, and there is an opportunity, so that none of you will be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin, its cleverness, delusive glamour, and sophistication. That is Hebrews chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, amplified. Now we're going to read again in the King James. Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They always do err, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And then 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened with the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 8 through 13, King James Version. So now, all right, first looking at verse 8, where he says, harden not your hearts, this is King James, harden not your hearts as in the provocation and the day of temptation in the wilderness. So here the author is actually quoting Psalms 95 and 8. All right? Let me see if I can uh, pull up. This is actually one of the scriptures that um, God has me pray. But it, they're literally, the author is literally quoting this verse. So I'm going to read it in the, in the King James. And it says, Psalm 95, verse 8, Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, in verse 9, right? When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. So, hmm. <laughs> I want to go some more into that, right? But, you know, it's like, nah. Stick to, stick to the lesson, okay. So going back, right, there's a reason why the author is pointing this back. First thing we have to remember is that in the New Testament, right, they did not have a New Testament yet. So a lot of things are coming. They're pulling from, uh, you know, what's called the Torah, right, or not the Torah, the Tanakh right, which we call the Old Testament. That's what they had. Okay, the New Testament was still being written. Okay. And so, you know, he's like, remember what these people did. Now, it's interesting, right, in the Amplified, how in um, in verse 12, in the Amplified of Hebrews 3, right, take care, brothers and sisters, that there be not in any one of you a wicked, unbelieving heart which refuses to trust and rely on the Lord, a heart that turns away from the living God. (laughs) When you consider, right, if God has to constantly prove who he is to you before you start to believe him, then you don't trust him, right? Right? And we don't even think of, you know, an unbelief in that way um, as wickedness, right? Um, Oftentimes we think of, you know, I'll just say atheists because, right, they're the easiest, right? You look at the atheists and it's like, oh, well, of course they have a wicked, unbelieving heart. But it's like you constantly needing God, well, I don't know, you know, I'm going to have to see that before I I believe it. I'm going to have to see something. I'm going to need a sign or something before I move on that then you're acting just like the children of Israel because just like this reminder here, right, in Hebrews, there were some of them that did not make it. You know, 
I'm doing a study on Jude now, and, and again, it's like that reference of the children of Israel in the desert. They were that close to the promised land, and you did not make it because of your rebelliousness in your heart. Man, I don't, I don't know about this. All those miracles, and you still didn't believe. <laughs> you know, but then it's like, think about it, you know, it's like God's constantly doing miracles and new things in our life every single day. Every single day. And some of us still have a hard time believing people that go through these crazy accidents and it's like there's no way this person should have survived and yet it's like everything just fell into place everything fell in line and oh it was just fate no that was just that was jesus that was (laughs) that was the lord it was even in your own life you have to look and be like man i know that was nobody but god because there's no way right and it's like, if you really knew my ways, right? God tell them, if you really knew me, if you really had a relationship with me, if you knew my ways, right, you wouldn't have, 40 years? 40 years. And that's something, right? Because technically, right, they were cursed for 40 years to, to wander in the desert because of, you know, we just go, we we ain't going to move on it. I don't know. I don't trust that. That's something. Like, even in those 40 years, like, yeah, they could have at any time, you know. And it's like you're that close. Like I said, you're that close to the promised land and you didn't make it. What does the scripture say? That the righteous shall barely make it. So the most holiest, righteous person you know is barely going to make it. What a shame it is to be right there, to have Jesus right there and completely miss it because of unbelief in your heart. And then, like it says, it causes your heart to become hard. And again, I'm like constantly having these reminders from from myself, like, yeah, that hard heart careful right now the next one we're going to look at again talking about his ways of the lord right specifically of the lord we're going to look at acts let's go there acts chapter 18 and then we're going to look at verse 25 well Okay, y'all know. <laughs> I gotta remember to double check my notes. I need to slow down a little bit. That's what I need to do. So we're gonna read. We're gonna mainly look at verse twenty-five, right? But we're gonna be reading verses twenty-four through twenty-eight. So Acts chapter eighteen. Acts chapter eighteen. We're gonna start at verse twenty-four and read down. To verse 28, and then we're going to come back to 25. I'm sorry, y'all. Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 24, and this is uh, amplified. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent and cultured man and well-versed in the Hebrew scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being spiritually impassioned, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things about Jesus, though he only knew, though he knew only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly and fearlessly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained more accurately to him the way of God, Adas, and the full story of the life of Christ. 27. And when Apollos went, wanted to go across to Acacia, southern Greece, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples, urging them to welcome him gladly. When he arrived, he was a great help to those 
who, through grace, had believed and had followed Jesus as Lord and Savior, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public discussions, proving by the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed. And that was Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28, Amplified. So now, we're going to read it again in the King James. Again, starting at 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Acacia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And that's Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28, King James Version. Okay. So this word here, right, 25, Adas, the way of the Lord, right, the spiritual path, spiritual way of the Lord. Remember what the, what is used in this context, right? This is what is used metaphorically of a course or conduct or a way of thinking. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? I cannot, I mean, that's what I'm going through literally right now. Um, as God has been teaching me, basically having to reteach me about certain things, like one of those things is his mercy. And so he's just been really going over that with me again and again and again and again. But it's like, I cannot, like he pointed something out to me, right? Like, he's like, you notice that when you come to my word, your mindset is almost always on like condemnation. But you don't come to my word seeking to see the totality of me. My love and my kindness and my compassion for you, my mercy towards you, my grace upon you, right? And even in those things, it's like, oh, God, I don't deserve. He's like, yeah, you don't deserve anything, but I still give it to you anyway. I want you to see that part of me. I want you to know that part of me, right? He's like, from now on, when I want you to come to this word, I want you to look for me. And it's like, man, this was some bad stuff that happened, but how did I show up in the middle of the bad stuff? Because that's how I'm going to show up in your life too. So I need you to see that part of me, right? And so it's the same thing. Like, we cannot... Mm, I swear that that's what's happening today. It's like, oh, I'm going to live how I feel like is right to me. I'm going to go by what feels good to me, right? I'm going to interpret the word how I think and in the way I think it means, but eh, you know, and I think that's good enough. And it's like, no, it's not, though. It's not. So it's like to really become like Christ means that I have to completely change the way that I see things, right? My perspective on on life has to change. The way I approach this word has to change. The way I see myself has to change. And that begins with me knowing who God is for myself. Like one of the things that, uh, another thing that he's been like kind of reteaching me about is love, right? In First John 4 and 8, right, for God is love. That's part of the, the verse. I mean, I got my Bible here. Let, let's just read it. <laughs> I was, 
I was but I'm like, you know what? The Bible right here, let's just read it. Let's just read it together. So first John chapter four verse eight. First John chapter four verse eight. And this is King James because this is the one that I'm trying to remember. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Right? And so something he's been having to, you know, reteach me on that is you can't know what love is until you know who I am because I am love. So when you open your mouth to be like, oh, I think, I'm, I think I love him, I think I'm falling in love, you don't even know what that means because you don't know who I am. <laughs> right? You don't know what that means. When you say that you love someone or, you know, like, oh, you know, I love my mom or I love, it's like, how do you, how do you know that? If you don't know who I am, you can't know what it means to love someone, anyone, not just romantically, like your friends, your family. You don't really know what that means. And a love of completely devoid of me is not love. A love apart from me is not love. Not. So, yeah, in everything, when he, when he means he wants all of us, he wants all of us, including your mind. Like, that has to change. Your thought process. Like, yeah, when you was in your flesh, there was a way that you processed things. There was a, your opinions and your beliefs and your belief system, your internal belief system and way of doing things. And that has to change. Like, you can't, you can't. I cannot do things the same way that I did before I came to Christ, before I gave my life to Christ. It's not going to work. Right? So then looking at this, now Apollos was instructed in the way of the Lord, but he only knew up to the baptism of John, right? So he didn't know about, okay, he knew that we have to remember, right? We have to go back to what was John doing at this time, right? He was sent to prepare the way for Christ. Because remember, he tells the people, like, hey, there's one who's coming who's sandal, right? I am not even worthy <laughs> to, un- to unstrap, right? Like, I'm not even worthy. Like, the the true Messiah is coming. So y'all need to repent. Y'all need to repent. Y'all need to get ready because he's coming. And so he didn't know yet about that that part about Jesus coming, his his resurrection, right? how he's, you know, died for our sins on the cross. So then what happens? Aquila and Priscilla come. They didn't teach him further, right? He just had some incomplete, you know, like they said, it wasn't incorrect or anything. He wasn't teaching false doctrine. It just wasn't complete. So they helped him to further his learning how. They discipled him. And he was bold in his faith. At that, you know, clearly he was going with them. He was going toe to toe with people. <laughs> like, n- nope. Like, let me tell you why he's a Messiah. Let me show you through the scriptures. And that's another thing. He didn't come at them like, oh, because he was. It says the scripture says he was eloquent. This man was highly intelligent, very well spoken. Brilliant, okay? So was there a chance he could have wordsmithed them under the table? Probably. But he didn't do that. He convinced them through the scripture. At the end of the day, people need the word of God. They don't need your opinion. They don't need your feelings. They need the word of God, right? Now, true enough, if people are not you talking about somebody who's got a hard heart, and you know, in my case, I laugh like looking back over my life, like God, like man, why did it take all this to get, to get me to this place? And it's like, girl, you didn't have hard soil; you had concrete. You you had a layer of concrete that was so thick over the soil that God had to do some major construction just to even clear the field enough. To so you break up the soil and then create new fresh ground 
and then plant the seeds, like, he had to do a lot of work. <laughs> right? So it's like, just because a person's heart is hard or whatever, it's like, plant a seed anyway. You don't know what God is doing in that person's life. Not everybody's going to receive it, but you plant the seed anyway, or if the seed has already been planted, water it anyway, and trust that God's word is true, that he will give the increase when it's time. You know? I feel like we've said that before, right? Just because I plant a seed in the ground, you know, an apple seed, I'm not going to get a, an apple tree overnight just overflowing with apples. Like, that's it takes time. Sometimes it might even take. And it's like, man, this soil is really bad. I might have to plant a new spot. But you know what the beautiful thing about God is that even when the soil is bad, he can make it happen. We can't. <laughs> but God will do a thing where it's like, mm, no, it's, you're not ready to plant there yet. But keep trying anyway. <laughs> keep trying anyway. I'm going to work that one out. I'm going to work that one out. But keep loving on them. Right? I have somebody kind of like that now where the Lord is like, keep sharing. He's not in a place to receive it yet. You know, you keep trying. Because the person was like, oh, you know, you got to come to my box. So you got to do this and did you know. And it's like you have not built a relationship with this person yet. And they have been through a lot of church hurt. So it's like, don't do that. Just be their friend. You know, be there for them. Uh, love on them. But keep sharing those things that I give you to share because I'm doing the work. Trust that the work is happening. I know it gets exhausting. Because it's like, man, it seems like ain't nothing happening over here. We, we, it's like rather than condemning somebody like, oh, they didn't do that. They didn't come at Apollo, Apollos and was like, oh, you don't know your script. Like, wow, this is okay. All right. And then they took him in and they discipled him. And they furthered his understanding, his of the of the way of the Lord, so that he was able to go out even further and be even more bold for Jesus Christ. Wherever you are in your walk right now, God wants to do that with you. But like I said last week, right, discipleship is not something you can do on your own. Now, that doesn't mean that you just don't study at all. I mean, you know, you're not even trying to read his word. You got you to be in it. <laughs> God reminded me of that. That today, he, he's been getting on me because I'm supposed to be memorizing scriptures, right? And then I got a little lazy. Uh, um, and literally, the Lord had to remind me, like, if you have nothing to pull from, right? Like, how do you expect to withstand the enemy if you have no work in you to pull from? The way that you are able to repel against the enemy, right? is that you got to have a sword in you to fight with. <laughs> you got to have some word in you. There's literally a scripture, I think it's in Psalm 119, right, where it says, um, I'll hide the word of the Lord in my heart so that I may not sin against you, right, talking about I won't sin against God because of the word is in my heart. He's like, that's how you put the word in your heart. You keep memorizing it and you keep trying to put that in there every day. Until you know it, like the back of your hand. And then you learn the next, this next scripture, the next verse. It's like, we got to, you know, it starts there. Like Pastor always is telling us, right? It, it starts in your mind. How you think, it, it determines a lot of things, right? Because it's not what comes into the man, it's what comes out of him that defiles them, but it starts with your mindset. And if I'm constantly looking at things from the perspective of my fleshly carnal way, like, oh, I don't know how God is going to make this happen, the same God who parted the Red Sea, the same God who made the grass wet and the fleas dry, 
the same guy who was, who was a fire, a pillar of fire at night and a cloud over the day to cover all those people. We're not talking about a, a small group of people. It was thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that was walking in that desert who also kept their clothes intact. They was walking in the desert all that time. Their clothes, clothes were worn. Who was feeding the manna? Who like that guy? The guy who literally spoke the entire universe into existence. That guy. The one who literally said, <laughs> with man, this is impossible. With, with God, nothing is impossible. You can either be like the 10 who you looking at things from your perspective, right, where it's like, oh, my gosh, we're grasshoppers in comparison to these these giants. There's no way we can overtake them. Or you can be like them, too, who saw things from God's perspective, like, oh, God said we got this. Let's go in there and get it. Let's go. Let's go. Depends on the person, right? Now, there was one more note I see it in my side note, right? So this word instruction, okay, he was instructed, right, in Matthew 28 and 19. I know we touched on that before, right, that word teach is the command. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. It In the Greek, it means instruction. Right, to instruct someone. Be teaching someone, okay, you kind of like, it's a, it's a little mix of things. You're giving people information and, you know, they kind of have to study and things, whereas instructing people is kind of more hands-on. Like I said, teaching in some ways, you know, depending on what kind of learner you have, you might try to change your approach. You might have some hands-on things, but it's mainly just, okay, here's the lesson, here's the information I presented to y'all. You try to make it, break it down in a way that, uh, you know, they're able to comprehend it, <laughs> right? Instructing is more hands-on because that's what discipleship requires. It's life on life. You're adhering, <laughs> you know, to uh, your rabbi, who is Jesus Christ, you're sticking together. You're doing life together. So if you're out there by yourself, that's not exactly a good place to be. You need community. Like, that's nice if you listen to these. But you need some type of community. I don't, you know, in my case, my community is mainly online. You know, one day we, we hope to kind of be able to, like, see each other and stuff. But for now, we just meet on Zoom and, you know, we have our Bible studies and that's cool. We check on each other throughout the week, right? But like true discipleship is really like hands-on. Like you, like I said, you're doing life with these people. They know you, <laughs> okay, and vice versa. So like we need to make sure that we're taking that time too. But again, that starts with your mindset. Okay. Now, going to this next one. Again, talking about his ways. We're going to look at Matthew uh, verses, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 7. Let's go there. Ooh, excuse me. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14. And then looking at my time, I'm like, okay. I don't know, y'all. Sometimes I'll just be getting caught up in the, in the verse. I don't know. It's like, oh, and did you see this part? Like, I know y'all had to see that. And it's like, girl, girl. But it's okay. <laughs> All right. So Matthew chapter 7. Verses 13 and 14, and again, starting with Amplified first, and then King James. Enter through the narrow gate, 
For wide is the gate, and broad and easy to travel is the path, hados, that leads to the way to destruction and eternal loss, and there are many who enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow and difficult to travel is the path, hados, that leads to the way to everlasting life, and there are few who find it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Amplified. Now we're going to read this in King James. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, King James Version. So I have my side note here that I'm going to read. And it says, um, Serving the devil means I get to do whatever I want to do. I can do it to my heart's content, but the end is always the same, death. Serving the Lord means that there are boundaries. I don't get to do just whatever whatever I want, however I want, whenever I feel like doing it. It requires discipline, commitment, but also trust in a knowing that while I will get a no or a not yet from God, he truly has my best interest at heart. And it kind of goes back to that first one we read, right, about the children of Israel and that unbelieving heart in Hebrews 3. You don't trust God because you don't believe him. When you believe someone and you take them at their word, right, that shows trust. They tell you they're going to do something and it hasn't happened yet, but you believe them anyway because, like, oh, I, I know that they're going to do what they said they do. I trust them to do what they said they're going to do. Now, going back here, notice that the gate to hell, essentially like the path to destruction, the eternal death, and the Amplified says eternal loss, which, again, we don't even think about that, right? It's like you... Even the way we think of that, right, eternal life and eternal death, it's like think about what you're losing, what you're saying no to. And then think about what happens if you say yes to God, all the things that you're gaining. And so by choosing to go down this path of destruction and misery, right, talking about Romans 3 and 16, it's like you're losing things. Along the way, like, yeah, it's wide and it's easy and, and woo, we out here, right? <laughs> it's like, ooh, something's missing in my life. We've talked about that, you know, before, right? I, I don't have any peace. I don't have any real joy. And I share that with the ladies, right? There's a difference, a noticeable difference that I felt between the, you know, the kind of happiness, I mean, you know, that feel-good happiness that you get from the sin, but there's still this, like, bound, you're bound, bound up versus that happiness that comes from God that is a joy that can't be explained when you are free, when he has truly just gotten you up out of that thing. And it's it's a huge difference. Like, oh, I feel I feel it. I physically feel it. I mentally feel it in my mind. It's different. So it's like, yeah, you know, like we mentioned that before, right? The the motto of the Luciferians, right? Do as thou wilt, do whatever you want to do. No limits, no boundaries. No one gets to tell you no. 
Not yet. Why not now? <laughs> Why stop there when you could have more? But God says no and not yet for a reason. Like you're not ready for that. Not right now. That's not good for you. He's not good for you. She's not good for you. They're not good for you. No. I have someone better for you. No. That's not in my will for you. No. That's going to destroy you. No. So, yeah, when you talk about a narrow path, that takes that takes discipline. That takes commitment, right? But like I said, it also takes that trust to believe and know, like, my father, right, in heaven is a great father. And he only wants what's best for me, right? And he wants to be my everything because he loves me that much. So it's like he always is thinking of me when he does these things. When he was writing the plan for my life, he thought of me specifically. Like, man, this, this is going to be a little hard, but, man, this is really going to build her character. She's going to become a fierce warrior in my name. He just doesn't see it yet. But it's coming. Ooh, I can't wait. Can't wait to see <laughs> see her grow and blossom into this. And it's just like, it, yeah, in the moment, it don't it don't feel good. It don't feel that way, right? But again, think about that mercy. Something God showed me today. It's like you don't even realize how much God's mercy covers you in situations that are highly unfavorable. You know, I think back on those times, and now I'm getting emotional. Lord, help me get through. Um, I think back on those times when I went through horrible bouts of depression, like super, like deep depression, when I was suicidal from the time I was nine all the way up to like 32 years of age, the close calls I had. The years I was bullied, like, I mean, there's like a lot of rejection, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain. And then, you know, it gets worse, right? Because it's like, well, I mean, what are you depressed about? What are you unhappy about? It's not like you went through anything. You act like, you know, you went through this and it. And then that makes you feel worse. (laughs) Right? It's like, God, that was a lot of pain, like, to wake up each day and feel like you're being crushed alive. And just when you feel like you're right at that point where you can't take it anymore, you finally get home, you wake up, and then you have to start that all over again every single day. And yet even in that, like, but my mercy was with you. My grace was with you. I was with you in those times. <laughs> it is something. It is something, but it I'm not gonna lie to you, yeah, it, it takes it takes some time, right? But one thing is for sure, I cannot get there outside of his word. That's not gonna happen. Again, going back to what I said earlier, right, I can't know what love is until I know who God is. I can't know, understand mercy until I come to know who God is in my life. It's like, well, what, how, is, how does your mercy work, God? Teach me. That's what I've been asking for, so he's been showing me. And I'm like, wow, God is not one-dimensional. If I can't say anything else, I can say that. He is not one-dimensional. And oftentimes we have a very singular way of thinking of God and of his righteousness and of his grace and his mercy and and things like this. And it's like there are so many, it's like one interpretation, right, like we've been learning from the book, right, but many applications. Your God is not one-dimensional. So stop thinking of it like, oh, it's exactly this way and no. But even languages, he created languages, and languages don't operate that way. 
you can have one word that can have so many meanings depending on what context is used in. Like God's character and the essence of who he is does not change, right? But his responses can, right? When we have a heart change, he will change, change the judgment. Like, okay, I see that this person is, and again, he's not petty. Like, yeah, I, I ain't going to do nothing until you do this for me. That's not how God operates. That's how we operate. But that's not how God operates. Right? He is so loving and gracious and kind that when we do have a heart change, it's like, okay. Like in the case of King David, David really should have died when he when he did what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. Right? The consequence was he had to lose that child. But the mercy is, right, he didn't lose his life. Now, another way God showed me his grace is looking at Joseph. And I'm like, God, Joseph didn't do anything wrong. Like, these people lied on him. He got sold into slavery. Passed into prison at least twice because it said in your word he was in prison. Then the man saw him, was like, okay, made him a servant. Old girl lied on him, got thrown back into prison. <laughs> He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't do anything wrong. But yet his mercy was with Joseph. Because he was in a really bad spot. And it could have went a totally different way. But it says the Lord was with him. His mercy was on him. And God covered him. So he didn't allow it to be so. So it's like that's something to think about. When you are feeling some type of way about your life, when I tell you I've been there, I want you to take a moment. And it's like, okay, but is this how God thinks? When you think about the ways of God, like is this really who my God is? Is that how God sees me? Is this how is that was that what God says about me? Is that even true about God? Does that hold up in his court, ladies? <laughs> we talked about the women's Bible study, right? Looking at peace, does it hold up in God's court? Does it even stand up to his word? Is that even true? Because when I start really thinking about it and learning to see things the way God sees, it's totally different. But, you know, we got to stop here because can't go. I can't keep going over time now, but, you know, I'll be trying. But, <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and pray before I, you know, start rambling. <laughs> Lord God, um, I just want to take this time to say thank you. God, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your name, God. We thank you for everything in our life, even the things that we do not understand, even the things that hurt. And I pray, God, that you would change our mindset and our way of thinking, that we would see things the way you see them. I pray, God, that you would give us your understanding and your wisdom to build us up in your word, God, to help us to truly comprehend those things, and, Lord, to trust you, even those things that are completely beyond our understanding, that we probably will never understand, that we'll never never really know why it had to happen that way. But, God, we thank you anyway because your mercy and your grace has covered us every single step of the way, and you were always with us. You're with us right now because you told us that your Holy Spirit dwells in us, that we are your temple. So, God, I pray that you would just cover us this week, God, cover us throughout this season. Continue to remind us of your promises of what it says in your word. And, Lord, when we grow hardened in our heart, when we become restless, I pray that you would just move upon us, that your love would soften our heart. 
that we would not become unbelieving, but that we will remember that we can always trust you because we can take everything you say to the bank. So, God, we love you. We praise you, Lord God, and we give you all the glory. Hallelujah to your name, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, thank God, and amen. All right, guys, so I'll take care. Uh, We'll be back. We're almost done with this part. You know, and then we got to look at uh, peace, path of peace. Okay, but y'all be blessed. Have a awesome weekend. And bye, guys.